Okay, I'm going to begin with an exercise from section 2.1 that really summarizes everything that we did yesterday and it has a little bit more. So that should be a very good example. I got it from section 2.1. It's, uh, it's a similar questions to the ones that you will be doing in section 2.1. So I thought to go over it uh, uh, with you. What's being projected on the screen is an example from the homework. The nice thing about my math lab, if you guys want to do any question and you need some help, you can go to the questions help uh, menu and view an example similar to it, print the example and follow the directions given to you in the examples to do your exercise. And this is what I did. I just printed, downloaded and printed an example similar to a question that you will be doing. I'm just going to walk you through this to uh, try to review what we did uh, yesterday. So the question is, construct a frequency distribution for the given data set using six classes in the table. Includes the midpoint relative frequencies and cumulative frequencies, which we haven't done yet, but I'm, I'll be talking about uh, today. So you have this data set, guys, that you can see uh, uh, right here. You know, in order to construct the table, the first thing that you have to find is the class width. And the class width, as I told you yesterday, it's a maximum value minus the minimum value divided by the number of classes. If you go through this data set, you're gonna find out that the maximum value is 555 minus the minimum 46 divided by six. Now, if you divide, you're not gonna get 85, you're gonna get 84.8. .8. But as I told you yesterday, you must round it up. So if we round up, that takes us to 85. Here is what we do here now. You're gonna have something like that and you're gonna fill in blanks in here. So for 40, the lowest value, start with the lowest value, which is 46, and start adding 85 guys this way, not that way. That will be wrong to add this way. So you have to add plus 85 this way. If you add 46 plus 85, you get 131. 131 plus 85, 216, and so on and so forth. Now we need the value right here. Can someone tell me what should the value be here? You know, we're starting the second class with 131, so what should we put in there? 130. What did you guys say? 100? And 30. Exactly, it's the value immediately before that one. And then guys, start adding one, uh, start adding 85, or just do one number before, 215. 300, uh, 385, and so on and so forth. So let me show you the complete uh, first part. That would complete the first part. Now the second part, which is actually uh, the, the tedious one. You have uh, how many values? You have 29 values. You will have to figure out how many values are there in the data set between 46 and 130. You have to be careful. A lot of students make mistakes because they miss one value here and one value there. So just be very careful as you go through the data. And if I were you guys, I will cross off, you know, the ones that I, uh, I use. So then I don't get confused and, you know, just with other values. And you will notice that there are five values between 46 and 130. If you look at the data set right here, I'm not going to just uh, do it, but I'm just going to follow uh, the example. So there are five values here. And then you look how many values are there between 131, 215 inclusive. And let me show you the uh, table right here, right here. It's all done, the frequency, frequency, etc. Let me show you the finished model right here. And if you add them up, guys, you should get 29. There are 29 values, I believe, 12, and 8, 20, 23, 24, 27, and 2, 29. Now, how do you find the midpoint? So we've done this yesterday. We spent time on this, but we want to do the rest of them. The midpoint, how do you figure out the midpoint? The midpoint, guys, is the value in the middle of the class. And to find the value of the middle in the middle of the class, you just add up the two values and divide by two. So to find this one, it will be a 46 plus 130 divided by two. You will get 88. And then do the same here. Or if you guys don't want, don't want to do the same and do the math, guess what you can do? Just add 85, add the class width, and then you should get all those values. So once you have the class width, you really have the answers to almost everything in the table. 
Relative frequency. How do you find the relative frequency, guys? The relative frequency is by definition, the frequency divided by the sum of all frequencies. So this is nothing but five divided by 29. And this is nothing, guys, but seven divided by 29 and so on and uh, so forth. Oh, the frequency, I have a question about the frequency. To find the frequency, you just go back to the data set and figure out how many values are there between 46 and 130. For example, let's do this and show you that there are five of them, watch. Between 46 and 130 inclusive, okay. Not this one, not that one, not, not this one. Okay, this is one. This is one, two. Three, this is between 46 and 134, and there should be another one right here, 46. You see, count them, one, two, three, four, five, and then you just put five. That's how you compute the frequency. And then you do the same thing for the second class, third class, etc. that's how you do it. Um, so for the relative frequencies, guys, this is how you do it. Now, maybe a question you want to ask me, how do we know that we have to put three decimal places? The system will tell you that they want the answer around it to three decimal places or nearest thousand, so you provide three decimal places. Now, let me tell you about the cumulative frequency. Is this something new? A cumulative frequency is what the word means. A cumulative means everything. So. The cumulative frequencies for class 46 to 130 is five. That's the beginning, so we just put five. Now, let me tell you where the 12 came from. The 12 is for this class and the one before. So the two classes together, the second one and the first one together will give me five plus seven, which is 12, we put 12 here. Now for the third one, it's the third class plus the other two that we already did. So you just add five plus seven plus eight guys, which is 20. For the fourth class, it's a three plus eight plus seven plus five, which is 23. The last one should be the sum of all frequencies, guys, which is 29, as you can see. This class plus the previous ones, if you add all the frequencies, you get the 29. So it's an increasing number. It starts with the first class and goes as high as the sum of all uh, frequencies. So this is pretty much it, what I like you to know about section 2.1 in addition to know how to do a histogram uh, in this section. So that is the cumulative uh, frequency if you are asked to fill in a blank table like this one. And you will, there is a question exactly similar to this one. All right. Let's move on. So let's see what we have. Uh, well, before I move on, let me just do a couple more definitions here. Okay. These numbers, guys, right here are called the lower class limits. I have six of them. These numbers right here are called the upper class limits. So if you're asked to find a lower class limit, it is 46, 131, 216, 301, 386, 471 for class number six, and these are the upper class limits. So each class has a lower and an upper class limit. Okay, uh, what I'm gonna do here, the, the first page I intend, um, I intended that you, I will summarize, you know, that uh, the three sections in there, since we did section 2.1, so I'm just gonna put a summary of what we have done uh, so far. So the class width, guys, is the maximum entry minus the minimum value divided by number of classes. And don't forget you need to round up your answer. Lower class limit is the smallest value in a class. Upper class limit is the largest value. The class itself is a range of values. It's an interval. Like uh, 46 to whatever we put right there, 46 to 130, this is a class. And it's a range of values that includes 46 all the way to 130. 
frequency, how often, a value repeats in a class, a value or values. Histogram, we did I think a histogram yesterday. It's a bar graph where bars are connected, no gap. Relative frequency, guys, I just went through this. It's the frequency of the class divided by the total of all frequencies. By sum of all frequencies. So that's pretty much it, what we did. I'm gonna build on this and then continue uh, the lesson. So I'll put this on the side and then we'll go back and fill in the blanks once we finish more uh, sections, guys. Okay, I think we did this. We did the histogram yesterday and we're gonna do a polygon graph now. Tell you what a polygon graph is. Construct a frequency polygon for the data set. First of all, in order to do a polygon graph, guys, you have to do a histogram. So I'm just gonna do a histogram right here. So we have a five, we have an eight, a 12, 13, 11. I think the highest number is 13. So I need to scale this one so I can get 13. So I'm gonna do two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. This is for the frequencies. And this is for the height right here. All right. Okay, let's do 50 to 52 is five. Let me just put those so that will. You could scale it three, six, nine. You can do one, two, three. It's up to you guys, as long as you are consistent with the scaling. So I got a five here. I'm gonna start right here. That's a five in the middle between four and six. Uh, eight, this is eight guys. Uh, 12 goes high. Then I have 13 and 11. 13 is a midway between 12 and 14. Then 11 and it's uh, midway between 10 and 12. Okay. Now here guys, in order to label the X axis, you do the midpoints. Halfway between 50 and 52 is 51. 50 plus 52 divided by two. Now to figure out the rest, it's easy guys. What's the class width? The class width is a plus three. So just add three here, 54, 57, 60, and then 63. Now let me show you what a polygon graph looks like. You label this point right here, right at the beginning of the first bar and the end of the last bar. And then you label the middle of the top of, at the top of each bar. There you go. And then you connect them with the lines. That's a polygon means many lines. This is the first one, second one, third, fourth, fifth, and the last one from this point all the way to the end, guys. And what we have here is a polygon graph. You will not be constructing any polygon graphs by hand. You will be given one and be asked questions, but you need to understand how this was uh, uh, done. Um, no, we didn't do this one. So I'm doing this page right now, just right now. So uh, it's a student is asking me, I'm not sure if about this, but we did not do this one. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now.
But we did the histogram yesterday, didn't we, guys? We went over histograms, correct? This one. That was yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Let's move on and do a stem and leaf plot. That's an easy graph. I'll, uh, this is the only thing in section 2.2 that you need to know is how to construct a stem and leaf plot. Let me tell you what a stem and leaf plot is. And guys, for the sake of, okay, I'm gonna remove, I'm gonna remove this. Okay, a stem and leaf plot means guys, it's graph your data, split it up into two categories. One is called the stem and one is called the leaf. Uh, it is a stem and a leaf. Here, I have two digit numbers. 44 means I have four tens and four ones. 38, three tens and eight ones. 41, four tens and one one. So it makes sense to split up the data into single digit, the ones digit, and the tens digit. Now, what are the possible tens digits in here? We have 40s, we have 30s, we have 50s. Do you have anything else? 30s, 40s, 50s, so it's only 30s. 40s and 50s. So this is your stem, guys. Now the leaf. The leaf is the ones that we did not include there. I have a 44 here, so I'll just put a 4 here. Done. 38, I'll put an 8 here. 41, another one. 50, 5, 0. 36, watch. 36, another six. 43. 42. 49. 48. Okay, I'm just gonna remove this as well, just to this one. Uh, 35. 40, another zero. 37, guys, that's a seven. 41, another one. Oh, the 40s are popular here. 43, another three. And 50, another zero. This is called a stem and leaf plot. But for a reader, someone looks at this graph will make no sense of this one unless if you provide something for the reader to understand what this graph is about. What do you think you should provide someone who doesn't know statistics and learn how to read this graph? Even if they know statistics, you still have to provide this piece of information. What do you think I'm talking about here, guys? Any ideas? Okay, let's see. Label for the two sides, label, okay. Instead of the label, look what you do. We don't put anything actually here. Actually, this will not even be there. We provide a key for the person to understand what this graph, and look what you tell the person. You provide the key and you tell the person, if you see a three slash eight, understand that this is 38. You could have done five slash zero means 50. So just provide a key. That's very, very important that to provide a key to tell the reader uh, what this graph, how do you read this graph and how do you interpret this graph? Okay, so this is a stem and leaf plot. Now the other thing about stem and leaf plot, what about if you have three digits, guys? How would you do a stem and leaf plot in the case if you have uh, uh, three digits. Let me show you an example with a three digit graph. Watch. And I'll listen to you guys tell me what do you think we should do. Construct a stem and leaf. Here's a data set. Okay. 
Any ideas what the stem is going to be and what the leaf is going to be? What do you think, guys, the stem and the leaf should be? We have ones, we have tens, and we have hundreds. What would you suggest? Would the stem be 10, 11, 12, 13? So the, the tens and the hundreds, exactly. This is what your stem is going to be, the 11, the 10, the 12, and the 13. I agree. You are absolutely correct. And now let's do the rest, guys. Put a seven here. That's done. Uh, one, one, seven. Oh, sorry, it's right here. Well, yeah, it is seven, two, so it works. One, two, three. One, two, two. One, two, five. One, three, one. One, one, five, right here. Uh, 10, eight, so the eight is right here. 110 right here and 117 guys right here and don't forget the key you tell the reader that 11 slash 7 means 117 okay um i'm going to share this example i put on the test last semester and some students uh got it wrong and i would like you to tell me uh, why guys I gave uh, the students the following graph the following stem and leaf something I'm just gonna make it up I don't remember exactly what I did uh, but I'll just put something there okay and and one of the answers was Thirty-five. I'm just gonna put this. Forty-three. Okay, I put a key here, and then I asked the students this question, guys. I I gave him choices. Let me tell you what the question was. The question is from the graph, select the data set, and I can tell you most students selected this data set. They look 1515, 1616, 1717, that must be it, but they were wrong. Do you know, guys, why the students were wrong? The key has a decimal place. Exactly. They didn't look at the key. That's why I told you it's very important to look at the key. The key, 15, it doesn't say it means 15. It says it means 1.5. There was another data set toward the bottom, guys, that was correct, that students should have clicked, you know, just this one. And that would have been the correct data set, which is D right here. So just be, what I'm trying to convey to you guys, look at the key because it tells you the whole story about the data set. All right. We're going to go back and talk about misleading graphs. I'd like you to learn a little bit about misleading graphs and to see how people, you know, just display and try to convey to you some graphs that are misleading. Somebody is trying to make a claim that the volume of their sales has doubled. So they say the sales were here and now they were doubled. And in order to convey their message that the sales were doubled, guys, they say, this was a two by two, we're gonna make it a four by four. Do you think this is a misleading statistics? If you don't think it's misleading, uh, tell me why. This is misleading, guys. If you look at the first square, does it look like the second square is a double of the first square? What's your answer, yes or no? The answer is no, definitely. It's four times as big. This has four little squares. This one has 16 little squares. So actually it's not double, it's four times as big. But the person tried to be smart and did this. They say, I'm gonna increase the length 
double the length and double the width. But you know, guys, if you have an area, if you double the length and you double the width, the whole thing will get multiplied by four, not by two. So that's where, what's misleading. So uh, to pick the correct answer, the length of the side has doubled, but the area has been multiplied by four. So that is, that's what happened. That's misleading. Okay, I'd like you to look at the next one. Where do you think we have misleading statistics here? This is a misleading graph. And now from now on, guys, once you get the hint from me how to know if a graph is misleading, uh, right away you can tell. Just one peek at it and you can tell if they're trying to mislead you. What is not right about this graph? Any ideas? Did you guys notice when I labeled this Y axis, I start with zero and then three, six, nine, twelve. Look where this started at ten thousand. It did start at ten thousand. That is misleading. If the a vertical scale does not start at zero, the graph will be very misleading. So this is another example of misleading graphs. I'm going to show you uh, another example, guys. We're really you can tell if a graph is misleading or not. Watch this. So that answer would be a correct, Professor? Exactly. The vertical scale doesn't begin at zero. So from now on, guys, any graph that's not starting at zero, be sure that it is misleading. You can make a conclusion that it's misleading. And I'm going to give you an easier example. Just bear with me for uh, one second. Okay, I'm done. Okay, someone is uh, trying to make an impression that he, what, what, when you look at this graph, guys, look at it without looking at the numbers. Does it look like this person, let's say it's about sales. From the graph, does it look like this year is double of last year? You agree with me, yes or no? From the graph itself. Yes. Okay, I heard a yes, which actually it is, guys. This is twice as big. So the impression that you would make about the graph that whatever the person is trying to show, this person has doubled his figures. That's the impression. But look what the person did. This is the power of statistics. The person said, I want to mislead people. I want to start with 10,000. This person in last year, he sold goods worth of 11,000 and this year he sold goods worth of 12,000. So, and he did the scale of 1,000 each, but he didn't start at zero and you can do that, but you have to warn, you know, the reader that that's what you did. The impression that you make without looking at those numbers that this person doubled the sales, but actually no, it's barely any increase guys. This person went from 11,000 to what? To 12,000 only. This is how you can use the power, you know, of statistics, you know, to mislead people by tweaking the graph a little bit. But if you start at zero, guys, you don't have a choice, you know, just to make a mistake. The graph is going to look fine. Had you started at zero, look what your graph would have looked like. This is last year. And this is this year. Excel will not even uh, do anything other than this. And that looks okay. It looks like there is an increase, but not much. And actually it should be only $1,000, but they inflated the 1,000, make it feel like it is double, you know, the values. So this is misleading. This is not misleading guys, because it did start at zero right here. Okay. Let's go to the next page. And we're gonna go to section 2.3. It's an easy section. We're gonna use the calculator with this section. 
Uh, it's something that you're familiar with already. It's about the averages, the measures of center. They call it measures of central tendency. When we say average, people think of adding up the numbers and dividing by the number of quantities. But the average in statistics, guys, could mean one of three. It could mean the mean, which is the average that you know of, could mean the median or the mode. And we're going to talk about the three of them. Why do we need the average? Um, here is an example. A graduate teaching assistant was asked by the professor to grade some papers. She graded the papers and presented the professor, you know, just with the scores of 40 students on the test. And the professor asked her, how did the students do on average? She didn't know because she did not compute the average. So it is important to compute the average to know how the class is doing. And we're gonna learn about how to compute the three of them. The first one is called the mean. The mean, guys, you add up all the observations and then you divide by the number of observations. That's what the mean is. And do you have to do this by hand? Actually, no, your calculator will do uh, all of this. You're gonna see that. Now, your data could come from a sample or could be the population itself. If your data comes from a sample, then your mean is called X bar. So this is the sample mean. These are labels uh, that statisticians use to identify the mean. It, is, it has a name, a label, it's called X bar. Now, if your data is the entire population, is the population itself, your mean is labeled like this, mu. We call it a mu. So X bar is used for a sample and mu is used for the population. And I'm gonna show you how to find the mean of this data set. The following are salaries for four randomly selected employees at Microsoft. So this is a sample, guys. In order to find X bar, look how you do it. You add 130,000 plus 135,000 plus 133,500 plus 136,000. And don't divide, forget you need to divide by four. Okay, let's do the math. And I get the calculator. This is a TI-84 plus CE. You don't have to get the CE, but if you don't have one, I would invest in this one. It's a nice color screen uh, uh, calculator. So I'm just gonna do the math on the screen. So I'm just gonna do the arithmetic right here. 130,000 plus 135,000 plus 133,500 plus 136,000. We have to add order of operation first and then divide by four. So I got 133,625. This is the average. Okay. The next question, guys, is to figure out the median. What is the median? This is another measure of center. The median is the value in the middle of the data set, but you have to arrange the data set in order from smallest to largest. If you arrange it from smallest to largest, guys, let's, let's do that. 130,000 will be the first value. Uh, the next one is what? 133,500, then 135,000, and then 136. Can a student tell me where is the median going to be here? Where do you think the median is? What value would the median be? It has to be in the middle. The middle right here, guys. It would be, uh, we have to take the two middle values exactly. and uh, add exactly. them to the five methods. Yeah, because it didn't fall at one of the values. You, just like you did the midpoint and the frequency distribution table, you add them up and divide by two. Exactly. So the median will be, guys, 133,500 plus 135,000 divided by two. And then you just figure out uh, the answer. So it will be 134,250 
that is the median. Okay. Now uh, let's uh, let's give you a data set where I have an odd number of values, and I'm going to put it in order. Let's see how many I have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and let's put another one. Eleven. Okay. Let's find the median of this data set, guys. The median will be the value in the middle. If you want to figure out the value of the middle, cross one off from the left, from the right. One from the left, from the right. Left, right, left, right, left, right. Oh, there is the median, which is nine. Here's my question to you now. I'm going to make it a little bit harder now. Let's say I have 73 values and uh, they're listed in order already for you. And the question is to find the median. How would you find the median without doing all the work that I just did here? Any ideas? Don't tell me put him in the calculator. It's gonna be a lot of work to put him in the calculator. You have to input all the data into the calculator, which I'm gonna show you in a second. But I wanna see if you can tell me how would you uh, figure out where the median, what, what the median is going to be without doing, making a lot of efforts? So you have 73 values, guys. Couldn't you just do like 72 divided by two would be 36, so then you'd go to the 37th number? Well, actually, look what you could have done. Very close. You have 73 values. Add one to 73. It will be what? 74. Divided by two, it will be the 37th value. You're absolutely correct. I mean, what you said makes uh, works, but the book said put it in a different way, which is exactly what you said. So if you have 73 values, guys, you just add one to 73, it will be 74. Divided by two, it will be the 37th value. So here, I have how many values did I put? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11 add 1 to 11 guys it's 12 divide 12 by 2 will be 6 count 1 2 3 4 5 6 oh there is a median what from the other side 1 2 3 4 5 6 will be the median my next question what about if you have an even number of values let's say i have 80 values where do you think the median is going to be did you say 80 Yes, eight zero. Wouldn't you just divide that by because it's already even? Right. Okay, divided by two, I got 40, but the median is not at the 40th one. You see here, we had four values. Four divided by two is two. My median was between, was between the second and the third. So if you have 80 values, look what you do, guys. You divide 80 by 2, it's 40. It's between the 40th value and the 41st value. It's halfway through between those two values. That's how you find the median. Now let's go to the part where the calculator can find the mean and the median for you guys. So let me show you how you could use the calculator. What I did earlier, I used the calculator, but I didn't use the features of the calculator to show you how to do this. So. We're going to show you how to give the calculator the data set and ask the calculator to find the mean and the median. Here is how you enter the data. And by the way, guys, uh, under uh, resources by your instructor, you will have a handout on how to use the calculator in this chapter, which is exactly what I'm going to do right now. So you go to stat right here, then edit. Okay, I'm going to remove this, clear. So you can see a clear screen right here. Okay. You put your data in the first list. Just like in Excel, you have to input your data if you want to do anything, you know, with numbers, same thing with the calculator. So you have to provide the data. I'm going to use the example that we did. So find the mean of the four values. So I have 130,000. Then I'm gonna do 135,000. You don't need to arrange your data in order when you use a calculator. It will take care of it by itself. Then I have 133,500. And then I have 136,000. And now you see the magic of the calculator. Okay. 
Uh, let's ask the calculator to find the mean and the median. Here's how you do it. You press on stat again. Watch me, guys. You scroll over using the right arrow key to calc. You press enter. Okay. Now, by default, you should see this, actually. The calculator is asking you, is there your data in list one? Well, yeah, you did put it in L1, so just confirm. Don't do anything here and just hit calculate and watch. You get the first value, which is the mean X bar, which is 133,625. And now you need the median. There is an arrow that is pointing down, guys. Just press the uh, down arrow and you can see the median right here, 134,250. We'll talk about the rest of the values later, but for now, it's the mean and the median. So this is how you can use a calculator to find the mean and the median. Okay? Any questions? Now let's do the mode. And the mode is easy. It's what you know of the mode. The mode is the value that occurs most often in the data set. Right here. And I'm going to give you an example here. Can you guys tell me what the mode is? It's the value that occurs most frequently in a data set. What value here do you see that occurs most uh, uh, frequently? I got the response from someone. I think it's 84. four. Yes, I agree. 84 repeats it three times. Okay. There is one type of data, guys, that you cannot find the mean and the median. You only can find the mode. Can you give me an example of this? Uh, an example of a data set where it is not possible to find the mean and the median. If you have numbers, you always can find the mean and the median. But if you don't have numbers, guys, if you have a qualitative data, like for example, if I survey you guys and tell you what's your favorite color, and I cannot find the mean and the median here because these are not numbers. How can I add color blue plus red plus black plus orange plus et cetera? So that doesn't make any sense. But you know what you can find? You can find the mode. The mode is the value that occurs most often. So if let's say most students say they like, you know, just a red color, then my mode would be red. So the mode can be used for qualitative data, but not for quantity. Uh, but for quantitative data, you can do mode, you can do uh, mean and median. All right, let's fill in some blanks here for the first two. Okay, what do you think I should put here? Four. What type of data? The mode is the only one of the three that makes sense, which I just covered right now, guys, for qualitative data. Uh, for quantitative data, the mean or the median are mostly preferred, guys. You don't need the mode. So we don't use the mode much. So for quantitative data, mean or median is often preferred over the mode as a measure of center okay now let me tell you what an outlier is and then we'll do an example explaining uh, uh this an outlier guys let's say if i survey you and ask you guys on average can you write down how much do you spend on lunch and then i get responses from students some of you will say five dollars six dollars seven dollars eight dollars two dollars and then one of the students put sixty dollars in there so this students decided you know just not to eat probably at the college cafeteria but go and have a nice sushi lunch at a nice uh, restaurant and spend sixty dollars the $60, guys, is considered an outlier, an extreme value, because it doesn't seem like it belongs to the data set. This is one example of outliers. Another example of outliers, let's say, guys, I give you a test. For some reason, for a good reason, all of you perform very well on the test. Everybody was scoring 80s, 90s, 185, et cetera, except for one student who got 17%. You should agree with me that the 17% is an outlier. So 
An outlier could be a very large value or it could be a very low value. And I would have, you know, to do a research and find out why the students, you know, just perform that low because it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it belongs, you know, to the class because everybody else did better. So that's what an outlier uh, is. Now I want to show you, I want to show you the effect, you know, of outliers on the mean and the median. So please bear with me. We're going to do this example together. And uh, please participate in the class when I ask you not just a question about it in a second. So here is the example. There is a neighborhood that has five homes. A block of the street that has five homes with the following values. Uh, first house is worth about $78,000. Second house is worth 75,000. Small houses. One is worth 70,000. The next one is 79,000. And then at the end of the block, somebody has a triple lot with the house that is worth $870,000. Okay. Here's my first question to you is to find the mean. Okay, let's find the mean. We'll put them into the calculator, add them up and divide by five. So let me do that. Uh, 70, let me just put this right here. So you can see guys what I'm doing. So 78,000 plus and in the meantime, if someone of you can compute the median for us, because we're going to need it, plus 70,000, plus 79,000, plus 870,000. And then I'm going to divide by 5. And my it's $234,400. What's the median, guys? The median is the value in the middle, but you have to rearrange the data in order. So if you rearrange your data in order, what do you get? 78,000, let's see. Let's me rearrange them. So 70,000, 75,000, I agree with you guys, you're correct. 78,000, 79,000, 870,000. Now you'll see the message that I'm trying to give you from this exercise. So this is the median. Okay. Let me say, show you the power of statistics here. You are a real estate agent. And the owner of this house right here asks you to help them sell the house. Here's what you can do. You can make an advertisement and say, we're offering this house for sale for 75,000. Where, so you're getting a great deal because we're gonna sell this house for 75,000, whereas the average price of a house in this neighborhood, it's about 234,000. Did you guys see where I got the 234? I used the mean. So I'm using the mean, I'm saying, the average price, the average house values in this neighborhood is 234,000, but you are getting a steal here. We're selling the house of, for 75,000. This is a misleading statistics, guys. And the real estate agent should not be using the mean to advertise the house. Now, why the mean is so much inflated? Can you guys tell why the mean is so much inflated here? It doesn't reflect the real picture of what's, what the value of the house in the neighborhood. Because of the outlier. Because of the outlier. The 780,000 is an outlier. So you guys, in the presence of outliers or extreme values, you should refrain from using the mean if you want to do a good statistics. An honest statistics, you should not be using uh, the mean. But look, if this real estate agent wants to be honest, look what he can say. We're selling this house for 75,000 and the average price of a house in this neighborhood is 78,000. 
which is the median. That makes sense. You should be using the median. But you can tweak statistics. And when you say average, don't assume it's the mean, guys. Now, I'm, because I teach statistics, when someone say average to me, I always question, does this person mean the mean or the median or the mode? So you have to question that right away. So in the presence of extreme values, guys, if there are outliers in the data, the median is preferred over the mean as the mean can be misleading. If there are no outliers, guys, feel free to use the mean. The mean is the best average that you can use. The mean is often preferred choice because it has some nice properties, okay? So that's what I wanted to tell you the difference uh, between. Uh, on the final exam last semester, I gave students the following question. I gave him a data set. I asked him to find the mean, the median. And then I asked him which measure of center is a better representative of the data set. And there was an outlier there. So many students who did not forget that the median should be used when you have outliers, they specify the median and they say, because there is an outlier, there is an extreme value. Okay. This is not important. I didn't put any questions in the homework about weighted mean, but I wanted to understand that because this is how I compute your grade at the end of the semester. So let me explain the weighted mean for, uh, for you guys. Suppose your grade is based on the following scores, exam one, exam two, final exam, homework project. And your exam one count 20% of the grade, exam two is 20%, final is 25%, 20% for homework, 15% 15, 15 for project. How do I compute your grade? It's very simple. I do ask Excel to do 20% of 84, so I do 0 0.20 times 84, then 0 0.20 times 75, then 0 0.25 times 75, then 0 0.20 times 100, then I do 15% times 85. And what do I do with all of them? I just compute the values and add them up, guys. So this one would be 16.8. This one is gonna be 15. This one is gonna be 25% of uh, 75, so 19.25. This is a 20, and then you do 15% of 85 and then add them up. Isn't the final exam 72 though, not 75? Oh, 72, you're correct. So that's gonna change now. That's gonna be 18. You're correct, thanks. And 12.75. And then final average. That's how my math lab grade book works because I put weights in there. That's how I do use Excel to compute the final grade. I don't do any of the work by hand. It's all done automatically, but this is how it is actually done. 16.8 guys, plus 15, plus 18, plus 20, plus 12.75. So when I tell you in the syllabus that your homework is gonna count 12% of the grade, whatever your overall homework score is, let's say you end up with 95% average, I do 12% times 95 at the end of the semester to compute this. And that should be about 82 point something here, which is a B grade, okay? That's the weighted mean. All right. Now, when you do a histogram, you're gonna see different shapes. I'm gonna show you the most common uh, shapes in there. This is a histogram, guys, but what's so special about histo this histogram? What do you see? that's something that really uh, trigger your attention about this histogram. What does it look like? Any, any ideas? Do you notice that it is symmetric, just like the mirror? This is the mirror right here. And this is split into two equal half. This is called a symmetric uh, distribution. Distribution or histogram, we're gonna start calling distribution, so of the data set. 
So this is called symmetric. And for your information, when you have a symmetric graph, the mean and the median, the mode are exactly the same. They are all right here in the middle, guys. So this is the most popular uh, histogram. Most of the data we collect turns out, turns out to be, to look like uh, a symmetric. So this is a symmetric graph right here. Actually, we have a comment here. Okay. And uh, another name for this one, guys, other than symmetric, uh, it starts with the letter B. Can someone tell me what do I mean by that one? What does it look like now? What is this, guys? Bell. Yes, bell-shaped curve. So symmetric or bell-shaped curve, guys, is, uh, is the same thing. Okay. Um, this one. This is called uniform. And let me tell you what uniform means. Means the value occurs the same number of times. Look, number one occurred 20 times. Number two occurred 20 times. Number three occurred 20 times. This is uniform. We're not very much interested in this type of graph. We are interested in this, the first one. But let me give you an example of uniform. If you roll, if you toss a coin 200 times, guys, the outcome could be heads or tails. Well, if you do it 200 times, your expectation that you should get tails 100 times and heads 100 times. That is a uniform example. Another example, guys, would be if I roll a die 600 times. The die has six faces, one, two, three, four, five, six. If the die is not loaded and it is a fair die, you would expect to see the number one show up, face up 100 times, two show up 100 times, 100, 300, 400 times, 500 times, 600 times, because you have 600, because this is uniform. And actually, I'm gonna demonstrate this on the calculator with you guys. This is a simulation here. We're gonna roll a die. I'm gonna start rolling and uh, I'll show you. Okay, now we're gonna roll 50 times. I'm gonna roll another 50 times. Another 50 times. Do you see, guys? It, uh, do you agree with me that it's getting to be uniform? Number one, two, three, almost the same heights. So I can keep doing this, you know, 600 times. And uh, it, will, it will balance out. The more times you do it, it's just going to balance at the very end. So this is, see, guys, it, it looks like most of the bars have the same height. This is an example of uniform uh, distribution. Now, let me show you this distribution right here. It looks like there is a tail toward the end, guys, from this side. This is called the skewed left distribution, and watch how it is a skewed left. Look at the tail here. There is a tail toward the left. So this is called the skewed left distribution. And then the last one, as you notice, guys, there is a tail toward the right. And if I want to represent this with the graph, it would be like this. This is the right uh, school distribution. Now the question that I'm going to share with you, that's an important one, and I put on the final exam last semester. I gave my students, I don't remember whether it was a school right or left distribution, and I... <laughs> I marked three values on the horizontal axis, A, B, C. And then I asked the students to tell me which one is the mean, which one is the median, and which one is the mode. Let me tell you how you can figure this out. If you have a symmetric distribution, they are all the same. But if you have a skewed distribution, you get three different values. Um, I'm gonna show you how to answer this question. So I'm just gonna do the graph right here. Okay, do you guys agree that this is a school right distribution? And I'm gonna pin the three values right here. Okay, 
Look at this graph, guys. Let's do the easy part. Which, va which value do you think it's the mode? C, B, or A? That should be easy. Can some C. C, why C? Can you, can you comment uh, why did you say C? I agree, Jumana, it is C, why? The highest. The highest, exactly. So that's the mode. Can we guys agree on this? Now, the challenge is to figure out which one is the mean and which one is the median. Here is the hint. The mean is always the closer value to the tail of the distribution. So it's always closer to the tail of the distribution. Which letter is closer to the tail of the distribution? Is it A or B? Do you guys agree with me that A is closer because the tail is on the right and A is the closer, so that must be the mean. And that will leave you the mode, uh, the, the median, I'm sorry. That's how you figure it out. And I put uh, that the conclusion is right there in the handout. The mean will always uh, fall in the direction in which the tail of the distribution is giving. So this is for right tail. For left tail, guys, the mean is going to be uh, smaller than the median because it's going to be on this side. Okay, so this is how you can tell. So if you have a distribution that is skewed left or skewed right, uh, the mode is easy to find, but the mean is always the closer to the tail of the distribution. All right. So, um, I'm going to pause the recording for one second and show you another. Okay, it's on page 76. If you go to your textbook online, it's uh, number 35. And the question was to label the mean, median, and mode right here. Which is the median, which is the mode, justify your answer. So you guys, what do you think? Let's figure out the mode first of all. Which one is the mode? Okay, do we say, a is being uh, the mode. Let me see what responses were. Yes, the mode is A, good. And now, which one is the mean and mean? Let's find the mean because we know it's a closer to the tail. So what do you think the mean is, guys? C, yes. And then we're left with B for the median. And look, this is another question similar to that one. So this is how it works. Okay, one more question I like you, I like to do with you is this exercise. It's on page seventy-seven. Okay, I would like you to determine which measure of center you should be used to explain each of the graphs. So look at graph thirty-seven, guys. Which measure of center do you think you can use? to summarize, you know, this graph. Can you use the mean or the median here? What type of data do you see in graph 37? This is not the quantitative data. There are no numbers here. These are surveys and people were asked to either select always, sometimes, rarely, or never. So do you guys agree with me that the data is qualitative and when it is qualitative, we have to use the mode, exactly. And what is the mode here, guys? It's always. So the most common response is always. Okay. For 38, data is perfectly symmetric. I would just use the mean. That's the mean. For 39, also the data is symmetric, guys. I would just use the mean as well. It's not perfectly symmetric, as you can see here, uh, toward right here. It's not exact, but it looks bell shaped. It looks symmetric, so I would use the mean. But look at 40, guys. What do you suggest we use, the mean or the median here? Do you see some extreme values? Yes, median, I agree. You see, because of this right here, that looks like an extreme value, so we're better off with the median. This is what very much you need to know in this section, guys, 2.3. Okay? And now we're going to go to section 2.4. I might not be able to finish the entire section, so we're just going to get started, have an idea of 
what this section is about. Measures of variation. This is something probably you're not familiar with, and I think this is the most important thing that you will get out of today's lesson when you learn about this section is measures of variation. Okay, let me give you this scenario here, guys. <clears throat> I have three classes, uh, class one, class two, class three. We have their test scores. We have their mean score and we have their median score and they are all the same. It turns out to be 75 is the average score uh, for class one and the median is 75. So they have the same measure of center. The question is, I need to compare these three classes and see which class is performing better than the rest. Well, I couldn't, be, I couldn't tell you know, just from the mean and the median because they are very much the same. So what can I do? Are there any other tools that I can use to help me decide and dis distinguish one class from the other two? Well, the answer is yes. There are some other ways to distinguish, but the mean and the median are not going to cover it for us because they are the same. If they are the same, then you wouldn't be able to make a decision. So I'm going to introduce what we call the measures of variation. And the first measure I'm going to introduce you might be familiar with is called the range of the data set. The range of the data set, guys, is equal to uh, the larger measurement minus the smallest measurement. So it's a difference between the maximum and uh, the minimum. So if I want to find the range of class one scores, we find the minimum to be 50, guys, and the maximum to be 100. So it is 100 minus 50, which is 50. OK? If you want to find the range of class two, I'll add it up here. What would that be? 51, oh, same range. But let's see the range of class three. Uh, 80 minus 70, oh, that's a smaller range. From the range itself, guys, can you, can you differentiate the three data sets? Any ideas? The range of class one test scores is 50, class two is 50, not much change, but class three is 10. What can you say about class three? From the range only, from knowing the range. Any ideas? No ideas? Let's see, I got one coming. Oh, good. It says the scores are more similar, closer together. Yes. If the range is small, that means the scores are closer together, that probably they are more consistent than the other two classes. I agree. The only disadvantage, or not the only disadvantage, the big disadvantage of using the range, that it only, <clears throat> it only accounts for the smallest and the largest value and ignores the rest of the values. So if you have a data set, guys, that have 100 entries and you are asked to find the range, you're going to have to ignore 98 of those values and only pick the smallest and the largest. So this is a big drawback of using the range. Is there a measure of variation that uses all the values and still uh, give us you know, some more input, a lot more constructive than the range? Yes, there is, which is called the standard deviation. So I'm going to do, discuss the standard deviation with you guys, show you how to find it using the calculator and by hand. You won't be required to do it by hand, but I feel that you need to see how this is done by hand. You probably will appreciate the calculator a lot more once you see that. So the next measure of variation we're going to introduce is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure to tell you how far spread out how widely spread out the data is from the mean how far apart the data values are from the mean the smaller the standard deviation the closer the values are to the mean the larger the standard deviation the more widespread the data values are so let me explain the standard deviation and show you how uh, to do it on the calculator as well okay so let's do the standard deviation here. 
This is an example. Now, the standard deviation, guys, is labeled with S. Standard deviation of a sample is called S. Now, standard deviation of a population, if they give you the entire population, it has a different label. It's labeled with sigma. This is a Greek letter, guys. I didn't make up those uh, names. They're the universal. So S refers to a sample and sigma refers to population, but they're both called the standard deviation. Now, most of the time, guys, and most of the exercises, you'll be working with samples, so it's mostly S, but you need to distinguish between the two. So, I'm gonna, he wants us to calculate the standard deviation of class one scores. Let me show you how to do this by hand. And then we'll use the calculator. You'll see how the calculator did this. So I'm, I'm sorry, gonna, Professor, did you say that's an R for us, uh, population? S. Oh, oh S. they're both S. S. S for sample and sigma for uh, standard deviation of population. Thank you. No problem. Okay, watch guys and see how much work we're gonna do to find the standard deviation and then how the calculator can do it in no time for us. We'll do this and we'll conclude the discussion. Okay, you put the data, you list the data, you will put the mean. We already, I already did the mean for you guys, it's 75. So write down the mean under each value. I'm just gonna show you how to do this by hand. You can help me out here if you have your calculator handy. And the values, we're gonna label them as X. So X and X bar. Now subtract the two values, X minus X bar. What do we get? 50 minus 75 is negative 25. 60 minus 75 is negative 15. 70 minus 75 is negative five. Uh, five. 90 minus 75 is 15. And 100 minus 75 is 25. That's the first step. The second step, guys, I like it to square x minus x bar. So whatever you came up with here, squaring. Negative 25, if you square it, it will give you 625. This will give you 225. 25, 25, 225, and 625. Now add them up. We're almost done. Uh, 625 plus 225 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 625 plus 625 plus 625. What do we get? 625 guys plus 225 is 850. And another 50 is 900, 1100, 1750. Okay, two more steps and I'll show you how to find the standard deviation. Now, so this is step number one, step number two, step number three, step number four. Take the 1750 and divide it by the sample size minus one. What is the sample size here? How many do we have in the sample, guys? One, two, three, four, five, six. The formula says n minus one, so we're gonna do six minus one, which is five. Okay, what is 1750 divided by five? All right, we're gonna quit here. 1750 divided by five will give me 350. And the final step, guys, take the square root. How do you do the square root of 350? If you guys are not familiar with this calculator, this is how you do it. You can put 350, watch, and then use the power right here, exponent, and put 0 0.5. 0 0.5 means a square root. Okay, I got 18.7. This is your standard deviation. It is large standard deviation comparing to the scores and because the range is very large, the scores are very widespread. So if you make, you can make a conclusion here that the data set is not consistent with the mean. 
because the standard deviation is very large. Now, how can I find the standard deviation, guys, by using the calculator? Now you're gonna see the magic of the calculator. So let me show you how we could have done this and saved all this time. Go to stat, edit. Okay, I'm gonna clear this list. And I'm gonna put my values from class one. Okay, what were the values in class one? I had 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then 100. Okay, now let me show you how to find the standard deviation. It takes a few seconds only. Stat, calc, exactly what I did to find the mean, guys. One variable is statistics, L1, we're good, calculate. And let me exit the project. Yes. Do you see S, guys? It's the first, second, and third entry. 18.7. Not only it will give you S, it will give you a value which is the population standard deviation, but we will ignore this value because the data came from a sample. The calculator doesn't know whether the data came from a sample or from population. It will give you both. So you guys, you read the problem. If the problem says you are given a sample, your answer should be S. If the question says that the data came from population, then your answer will be sigma. They're slightly different. So the standard deviation is 18. Uh, 18.7. This is what <clears throat> the standard deviation of the data set uh, is. Any, any questions about this uh, standard deviation? There is a formula, guys, for the standard deviation. I wouldn't worry too much about it because you will be using technology to find the standard deviation. Here is the formula here. It's the same as this, but I put the square root here. Let me explain, uh, just explain how the formula works. The formula says you take each value and subtract the mean. Then you take, you square the difference just like we did. Then you divide by n minus one. So if your sample has six values, you do uh, six minus one, five. And then at the very end, you take the square root and this is the formula for the standard deviation. And that is what's built into your uh, calculator. Now for the population standard deviation, there is no n minus one, there is only n. So you just divide by the cell, by whatever you know the population size is. That's the difference between two formulas. Now you see another formula guys, and I wrap up with this. It says S squared. Can you guys tell me what's the difference between the two formulas here? Why the, uh, the first one doesn't have the square root? because it's a square. When you square a number, you get rid of the square root. And S squared, guys, is called variance. But we are more interested in finding the standard deviation S than the variance. So if you guys know the standard deviation, then the variance is just the square of it. So if you found the standard deviation of this was 18.7, and there was another question to find the variance, you just square this number and then you will get the variance. So I'm gonna stop uh, right here and just I wanna make an announcement before uh